Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the, must not take yourself too seriously, and 6-1 since that matters, and what do I even say other than, hey? <sighs> well, that's why they're introducing an all-new Bumble, with exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. I mean, if you think about addiction, like the medical definition, which I'm sure you know, is continuing to indulge in anything despite negative consequences, right? So if you show up at work and you start losing connection with your husband or your friends, those are negative consequences and you still keep doing it to the extent that you're doing it, then that qualifies as an addiction. Feel like you're in a constant competition between your career and your husband's patience? Your kids think you work too hard, but hey, you're doing it all for them, right? The struggle is real, and I've been there too. Moments of feeling like a crappy mom and wife because once again, your kids had breakfast on their way to school, and you've got more important things on your plate than cooking and cleaning. Hey there, working moms who are juggling a million things and still wondering if you're doing it right. I'm Veronica Cisneros, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, a mama of three, and married for 24 years. Welcome to the Empowered and Unapologetic podcast, where we dive deep into the messy, chaotic, and sometimes hilarious world of mastering motherhood, marriage, and business. I get it. Balancing it all was never the goal, but here we are trying anyway. I'm here to share my journey and guide you through yours. No more apologies for being driven and definitely no compromises on your dreams. Together, we'll navigate the challenges of being a powerhouse in both business and family life. Join me as we tackle the uncomfortable conversations from being the breadwinner to changing the rules of what a marriage looks like. Let's figure out how to parent in a working parent household without the constant arguments or guilt. I'm Veronica Cisneros, and this is Empowered and Unapologetic, where we embrace the chaos, challenge the norms, and strive to live life on our own terms. Get ready for some real talk, actionable tips, and a few laughs along the way. Hey, ladies, welcome to the Empowered and Unapologetic podcast. I am your host, Veronica Cisneros. Today's guest, I was totally turned on to primarily because of her story. And she wrote a book, which made it 10 times even better. And I have her today, Laura Cathcart Robbins. Hey, Laura. Hey, Veronica. So happy to be here. I'm excited to have you. So let me go ahead and brag about Laura for a quick minute. She is the best-selling author of the Atria, Simon, and Schuster memoir, Stash, My Life Hit, My Life in Hiding, and host of the popular podcast, The Only One in the Room. And I'm going to tell you, I listened to a couple episodes. I'm totally a fan. She has been active for many years as a speaker and school trustee and is a credited for creating the Buckley School's nationally recognized Committee of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Her recent articles on the subjects of race, recovery, and divorce have garnered her worldwide acclaim. She is the SDWF's 2024 Memoirist of the Year. I don't think I've ever said that word before. Memoirist. (laughs) Memoirist? (laughs) A TEDx, it's not very common. No, it's not. A TEDx speaker and an LA Moth Story Slam winner. Currently, she sits on the advisory board of the San Diego Writers Festival and the Outliers HQ Podcast Festival. Find out more about her on her website, lauracathcartrobbins.com. Laura, holy moly, I'm so excited. We briefly yes. met at Podcast Evolutions, like briefly, briefly met, yes. but I feel like yeah. I already know her. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, I'm I'm really glad that we met and shout out to Jillian Teets for connecting us. I love Jill. 
um, briefly, you know, just <laughs> like knowing that we needed to be put together in that moment. Yes. Totally, totally. So I went ahead and obviously, you know, went over your book. Um, and there's so many things on here. Um, if you can walk us through your journey documented in Stash, what are some of the most profound lessons you've learned about addiction and recovery that you believe could benefit other high achieving women? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I don't know that it's ever been asked quite like that before. I, the, the journey that I document in Stash is a 10 month period of my life in the year 2008. And, and during that period, at the very beginning of it, I asked for a divorce. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm spiraling down into an addiction that I can't pull myself out of. I have two small children. I am the parent association president at their school. I've just been asked to join the board of trustees, which is one of the credits you read yeah. at the end of my bio there, because I'm still on it. Um, and I had this very, I had, I, I, it's not very, I had a high profile life at the time. Um, and so this was very all public. Everything that was happening was public except for my addiction. Yeah which was very, very private and secretive. And I worked really hard to keep it a secret. And I worked really hard to stay in my kids' lives during this, this, this part of my life. Eventually, I couldn't hold it together anymore. The second part of the book is I go to treatment, which means I have to leave my babies for 30 days, which is the most excruciating time period of my life. Um, and then when I come back home 30 days later, it's the adjustment to being back home and the book begins with me asking for a divorce and it ends with the mediation. Yeah. So this, again, this all took place during 10 months in the year 2008. Uh, during that time, you know, while I was in treatment and afterwards, since I've been in treatment, I've been sober. So I've been sober almost 16 years now. Congratulations. This summer, it'll be 16 years. That is amazing. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it really is. If you read the book, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really amazing that, that I got sober. And, um, you know, I think that really what I've learned and probably more so in the last, you know, eight or nine years is that my problem wasn't addiction. My problem was really living inauthentically for so long since I was a kid yeah, and afraid to be myself because in my, the house where I grew up, it was not safe to be myself. It rubbed my stepfather the wrong way, and then my home became violent. So I learned to be, to adapt, to edit, to alter myself so that I could blend in wherever I was. Yeah. You know, survival for me meant not sticking out, even though I was black in all white spaces most of my life, figuring out a way to blend in. And and so by the time, you know, the addiction caught up with me, and I was in my late 30s, early 40s. I I had no idea who I was, really. I mm-hmm. just knew who I was to everyone. I knew who I was to my husband. I knew who I was to my kids. I knew who I was to the school. I knew who I was to my friends, but I didn't know who I was. And I think that was um, that was revelatory to me. That was the work really began in earnest for me to discover who I was. But that was years into sobriety, long time after this had all happened. And I'll just say this to answer your question. Um, I think that was one of the most valuable lessons. And the other one was was really that kind of superwoman complex I had. You know, the, the what I was addicted to was a sleeping pill called Ambien. Mm-hmm. And I was addicted to it. I, I mean, I started taking it because it allowed me to get sleep so that I could show up for the, you know, 6,000 things I was doing during the day, doing during the day. And the truth was I shouldn't have been showing up for 6,000 things. You know, I should have been more mindful of what my energy level was, what I could do, how I could be authentic and show up authentically. And I didn't even know about that. Yeah. I just was like, this is the life. This is what I'm going to show up for. And I think that made me really ripe for an addiction. Uh, it, yeah, absolutely. The complete breeding grounds. What would you say Ambien represented to you? What did Ambien mean to you? 
Oh, it, it was, so it meant a couple of things. I, I had been diagnosed with um, chronic lifetime early onset insomnia. So I'd always had trouble sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get a good night's sleep. And for me, that was like bliss, yeah. just, just the sleep, forget mm -hmm. how I got there. And, and then when I, when I took that first Ambien and I got the best night's sleep I'd ever had, you know, it was on for me. Like mm -hmm. I was just going to chase that forever. Um, I thought I really did. I thought this is how I'm going to live the rest of my life. I'm going to take an Ambien at night, right? Cause it'll give me that relief from the day and I can get a full night's sleep and I'll just take it every night for the rest of my life. That's no problem. Yeah. Thank you for this solution yeah, to awesome. the universe. Awesome. I was very pleased. I can be happy now. Right? I can be happy now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, and I was for for at least a year and a half, maybe, maybe pushing two. Yeah. But two was really when I started, my tolerance started to build. And so I needed one and a half to get to sleep instead of one. And I needed to take one in the middle of the night by the time I was three years in to get back to sleep. Yeah. So it, it snowballed pretty quickly then. Um, but it did work for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, placing all of these expectations, right? Um, uh, we go into, I, re I recorded a podcast episode with my husband yesterday and I was, I was, I was sharing with him that there are times, you know, yesterday I had a 12 hour day and it's like, it's not a big deal. It's just a 12 hour day. It's fine. And he's like, did you eat anything? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, totally. I had overnight oats, you know, no big deal. Um, and he's like, okay, that's awesome for breakfast. What'd you have for lunch? Um, and I'm going, there's, um, I'm going through a transition here, um, at my office. I own a group private practice, um, going through a little bit of a transition with, um, resetting systems and, and whatnot. And I remember him saying, you know, I, we were talking about expectations and the expectations we place on ourselves, which falls into perfection. Um, and I remember saying, you know, it, it, it was a podcast focused on, you know, husbands and what husbands need to know. And so he was saying, you know, well, with these expectations, you have to know when to call it quits. And so this is when we have to, you know, reel you guys in. And I was telling him, I gave a really bad example because it involves sports and I know nothing about sports. Um, <laughs> but I gave him a really bad example of, you know, being a pitcher and throwing balls and you're throwing balls. You throw the balls to the first guy, you throw balls to the second guy and they land on the base. And then the, co the, the, the coach comes to the pitcher's mound and is about to get us, you know, kick us off the, the pitcher's plate. And, um, you know, we have one more in us. Just give us one more shot, you know, and the amount of, I don't know if I would call it embarrassment, but it's like, please don't take this away from me. Like, please don't take this away mm -hmm. from me. You know, I, I got, I yeah. got one more in me. I got one more in me, you know, and my husband was, you know, was sharing like how difficult it is to kind of see me in that space of like, I, I'm totally convinced that I have one more in me when I have no more gas in the tank. I'm, I'm running. I'm not even running on fumes at this point. Right. Take me through that for you. And, you know, kind of going back to, you know, you were the perfect candidate, right? Because that not only applies to you, it applies to all of us, all of us, every single one of us can relate to that. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, you mean just like continuing to go when I have nothing left? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll I'll say that and I'll go back to to that period of my life, but now um my my boyfriend who I've also been with for 16 years because I met him the hour I checked into treatment, <laughs> which is another story, yeah. but it's still in stash. Um he takes really good care of me. Because when I'm writing all day or I'm going, when I was doing the book tour last year, yeah, man, I did not take care of myself. No. Like I, I did, you know, like I food prepped on Sunday. I meditate in the morning. I work out. Like, so I did those yeah. things, but I was back to back to back to back. Mm -hmm. And I just would go and he would appear with a bowl of something yeah. 
for me to eat that he would have just made and say, babe, you got to take, or he doesn't call me babe, he calls me hun. <laughs> You've got to take, you know, 20 minutes and, and, and do this, eat yeah. and fortify yourself. And it was actually because of him that I started, you know, installing these breaks in my day, yes. whether I wanted them or not. Um, where I can do a puzzle or, <laughs> you know, watch the news or yeah. yeah, I don't, I mean, I, when I say a puzzle, I mean on my phone, like Wordle or something like that. Yeah. And, and, and just don't work for 20 minutes. So I got to ask you um, or read a book. How do you, do, so yeah. I'm thinking um, one bit. So am I on that? Sure. Um, I can't say fully, you know, how, bringing a break in is ridiculously hard. I've had my assistant, she's like, Veronica, I could give two shits on what you have, think you need to do. We're going to abide by this 30 minute break. And you're saying puzzle, read a book. And then trigger word for me is phone. So you're saying, okay, wait a minute. I could do a puzzle on my phone. And then I could already see myself go from the puzzle to checking emails, to getting notifications so yeah, that right there. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I totally see what you mean. And, and so, so my work is much different than yours. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a writer. So sometimes there are author emergencies. <laughs> there are like, you need to look at this book cover before it goes to first pass, yeah. like that kind of thing. But rarely is any email that I get that urgent. Yeah. Um, or, and then if it's my kids, right, I'll, I'll, I'll break from my break to yeah. see what my kids need, but they don't, you know, it's usually not urgent either. They're actually strained because they're 24 and 26 year old boys mm -hmm. and they still call me. They almost never text me. So it's, it's a conversation every time, but that aside, <laughs> I can usually just ignore whatever comes up. Yeah. You know, if, if I did what you did, then I'm sure there were things that would come up that I would need to attend to. Yeah. So it's, it's easier for me, I think. Are you a high achieving woman feeling the weight of success yet struggling to find balance in your personal and professional life? If your mind is constantly racing with endless to do's, family demands, and the unspoken competition between career and marriage, you're not alone. It's time to peel back the layers and address the deep-rooted challenges. You've tried it all, vacations, bedtime schedules, restructuring your calendar, and heartfelt conversations with your husband. Despite your best efforts, the struggle persists, leaving you feeling unheard and stuck in a cycle of frustration. I get it, I've been there too. But here's the game changer, Empower X with me, a four month invite only experience crafted exclusively for high achieving women like you. This meticulously curated group is your sanctuary for support, knowledge sharing, and a community committed to scaling businesses while enriching family life. Picture this, virtual mastermind meetings with a sprinkle of coaching every three weeks lasting two hours where you'll engage in deep dives into your challenges. It's a space for high impact skill sharing, fostering growth and unlocking breakthroughs in both your personal and professional life. As if that's not exciting enough, Empower X features an exclusive in-person retreat hosted by me in San Diego. Imagine practical workshops, meaningful connections, and a chance to strengthen our community bonds in a breathtaking beach setting. And the support doesn't stop there. With continuous access to our private messaging channel, you're just a message away from the guidance, advice, and camaraderie you need, including direct interaction with me. Ready to break free from the cycle and embrace a life where success doesn't come at the cost of your well-being. Apply now to Empower X. It's time to prioritize your aspirations, enhance your marriage, and approach motherhood with newfound confidence and support. Your journey to intentional living starts here. Go to veronicacisneros.org forward slash Empower X. Again, that's veronicacisneros.org forward slash Empower X. 
I'm so excited to meet you. This bleeds into the next question. In your book, you talk about the importance of dismantling the walls you had built around yourself. What advice would you give women who may be struggling to break down their own barriers? These included, whether it be addiction or their own personal Mm -hmm. challenges, right? There is something about being addicted to work. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think about addiction, like the medical definition, which I'm sure you know, is continuing to indulge in anything despite negative consequences, right? So if you show up at work and you start losing connection with your husband or your friends, those are negative consequences and you still keep doing it to the extent that you're doing it, then that qualifies as an addiction. But as far as building walls, I mean, this is something I'm very well practiced at. Like I said, I started it when I was little. My stepfather entered my life when I was five. Those were the first walls I built. You know, so I've actually, you know, gone for almost 60 years. Well, now, you know, since I've been in recovery, it's been a little bit different. But let's say I went for 50 years without not knowing how to build a wall. Like all I knew how to do was build walls to protect myself. Yes, My mind doesn't think of it as anything other than survival. You know, this is, this is how we survive and. And keep the peace. um, This is how I protect myself. This is how I keep the peace. Yeah. How I can experience some form of joy. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the, the first thing that one, Scott would literally say to me when we first got together, he would say something and I would feel slighted maybe and shut down right? He might have made a joke at my expense or, or even just like I perceived it to be at my expense, whatever it was. Yeah. And I was pretty raw in the beginning. So yeah. I couldn't take, you know, things the same way that I take them now. And so I would shut down and he would like put his face on his hands like this and he'd peek over like he was peeking over a wall. He's like, I see you building the wall. <laughs> what can I do to dismantle it? Like, how can I help Aww, you take it down? Because I don't want you to build that, that wall. I love that. Yeah. So the awareness of when I was doing it, because he would, you know, li- literally bingo. peek over. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. Was, was really key to me being able to, to understand that in that moment I had a choice. Yeah. And I don't think I was aware that I had a choice before. I just thought it, I didn't even think about it. It's just done. So what Scotty helped me to see in therapy helped me to see in therapy was really key for me in this was that Every time, you know, as long as I don't have a drink or a drug in me for being an, being an addict and an alcoholic, I have choices. Yeah. I always have choices. Yep. And so how I'm going to either react to something, which is not great when I'm reacting or respond, yeah. which is much better. If I'm responding, there's probably a pause in there. There's probably some thought. And then maybe I can take the choice that'll make me feel better about myself mm-hmm. and, and be better for the relationship, whatever the relationship is. Yeah. It's not an emotional reaction. Your, your emotions are not driving the wheel. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. So that's, that's been, and then, you know, being, being honest about it too. Like, okay, so he hurt my feelings. Yeah. And so then, you know, we're going to be like two countries at war or I'm going to hurt him now. And then he's going to hurt me back and I'm going to hurt him. Yeah. Or do I just say to him that really hurt my feelings and I'm going to do my best not to punish you for it? Yeah. (laughs) Because that's the truth. Sometimes I can't help it, but I really do. Once I've said that out loud, I really do my best. I I love the word that you used, awareness. Oftentimes Mm -hmm. we are not aware of the things that we're doing and because we are not aware of it, we'll continue to push our limits. And the minute we're able to identify right. that, everything starts to change. Everything starts to change. Yeah. And I love, I love the example you gave, you know, with, you know, knowing the difference between reacting and responding. Because a lot of us think, well, it's fine. I, I handled it. And it's like, well, yes, but was that emotionally driven? you know, and if it's emotionally yes. driven, yes. there's not a lot of rationale, you know? And so 
is that a wise choice? And it's like, well, (laughs) so you start really, really (laughs) kind of looking at yourself. The next question I have, Mm -hmm. um, your book stash delves deeply into your journey of overcoming addiction and internalized racism while navigating a high profile marriage and Hollywood lifestyle. What inspired you to share such a personal and vulnerable story, especially since, as you said, it's pretty high profile. Like there's a lot of things, there's, there's a higher demand of keeping everything copacetic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, ironically, I'm an incredibly private person. Um, I've always been a really private person and my friends who know me, uh, you know, we don't discuss religion or politics or what goes on in the bathroom or the bedroom. Like I don't talk about any of that stuff. And most of my friends do. So they think I'm funny because I'm like, you know, (laughs) quiet when it comes to those topics for the most part. Um, And so to write something this vulnerable was certainly not my first choice. I, when I got sober in 2008, I looked for books like this written by black women and I couldn't find any. Mm. And I was really dismayed by that. I was really disappointed that, you know, there weren't any books that dealt from that intersection of race and privilege and um, addiction. Yeah. I saw books that were written by black women years before, nothing currently on the shelves. Um, but they dealt with like drug dens and prostitution and um, and gangs. And, and they were really important stories. I yeah. got a lot out of them, but they weren't my story. Mm-mm. And I wanted something that was reflective of my journey and I couldn't find anything. And then years later, when I started to put a book proposal together, it covered a much larger period of my life and every rejection, because everybody rejected me, every rejection that that responded with not a form letter pointed to this year of 2008 and said, that's your book. Ah, But this, this, what you're pitching is not your book. So I say that stash was the book that demanded to be written because it was not the book that I wanted to write. And even when I was looking, when I was writing that proposal and looking for comps, which are comparative titles, you know, the publishers want to see, books like yours that are that are currently on bestseller lists. Yeah. So you're like it's it's a cross between this and this or it's where this meets this. And I couldn't find any written by women of color. I I forgot like I forget black women. I'll take a latino woman, I'll take an asian woman, I'll take an indigenous woman, but there's nothing. And it didn't even have to be a woman. It could just be a person. And there was still nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I got to write this book yes. because there isn't one. I got to do this. And, you know, and because there wasn't one, I didn't know if publishers were going to like it or not. Yeah. I didn't know if they were going to say, eh, we're not really interested in that. Um, but, you know, it, it ended up being kind of a fairy tale author journey. You know, I, 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 I got an agent in November of 2020. I turned in the manuscript to her in April of 2021. And she sold it at auction. Um, All of the big five publishing houses were bidding against each other for it. And so she sold it at auction to Simon and Schuster. And yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was, you know, I wrote it in six months and it was published less than six months later. So that never happens. I mean, it's just feel like this is a book you didn't, I mean, this was the book that you weren't intended to well, I mean, you were definitely intended to write. Right. That was not your that was not your path. What is this like? No. I, it was really surreal. It was really and it's and it's interesting. I mean, because like the work you do, you're face to face with people. And I'm sure you get to follow along and see yeah. results. But with the book is so much different. It's like it's almost like giving birth and it's out there. Like when people report back to me on Oh, I, one of my sons, a chef, you know, he catered a party for us the other night and it was amazing. I love hearing that, but I don't really have ownership over how well he did at the party. Yeah. I'm proud of him. Yeah. Of course. But I don't feel like it's my credit, you know, like I feel like he's, he's, and the same thing with my younger son, I get these incredible bits of feedback and I feel like it was that, it was like that experience for me with my book, even though I wrote it 
it's like, oh, my book's out there doing well. Great. Hi. <laughs> so glad you're doing well out there. <laughs> but it didn't feel as connected to me for a while. So it, I was really grateful, but I wasn't, I don't think I was, I was as connected as I thought I would be to the experience. How did you celebrate this? How did you well, celebrate this um, yourself? Yourself. How did you yeah. celebrate this? I was not going to celebrate it. And and my friend Holly Whitaker, who wrote this incredible book called Quit Like a Woman, um, which was on the New York Times bestselling list, seller list for a long time. She actually read my first pages. She was the first person who read the pages. And um when the book sold, she sent me flowers mm. and a beautiful card that basically was like, oh, I should be celebrating this. Yeah, it didn't even occur to me. This is why to I asked celebrate the question, it because none of us celebrate our, yeah, our yeah. accomplishments. Yeah, right. So when she sent that, I it clicked for me. Like, yeah. oh, this is something I need to do. Um, so you know, Scott and I went to my favorite restaurant for dinner. I um, I just really tried to get into my body. Yeah. And relish the moment. Yeah. The hard thing is when you're launching a book, it's back. Well, for me anyway, it was back to back events mm -hmm. and I was traveling. So the day the book came out, I was leaving on a plane the next day. So it wasn't like I could just like sit and relish in it, even though it was freaking cool yeah. to be, you know, invited to DC, to be invited to New York, to be invited up to the Bay Area. Um, and to do TV and like all that stuff, which was also really cool. But I, I just tried to really savor where I was and, and meditation helps with that for me, just like centering. Good. That would be the form of celebration, yeah. uh, providing yourself that space to do it. I, I love that. I yeah. always ask that question because it is so important for us to celebrate any of our wins, any of our wins. And Again, it goes back to somebody acknowledging, right? And even us acknowledging, wait a minute, this this is something that should be celebrated. I love that. Like yes. having that yeah. awareness, right? Um, and I don't have any problem celebrating other people's wins. It's oh, so dude, easy all day. Me. All day. Listen, all day. I'm, I'm, but it I'm doesn't kidding. occur to me, right? Yeah. It's, cra it's, it's really bizarre that it doesn't occur to me to celebrate myself in that same way. I know, I know for me, um, and it's a story I, I, I'll share really quickly. Um, when I started my practice, um, I was, I was um, renting an office from one of my colleagues. And so it was her office furniture and everything. And um, they sold the building. And she took all of her furniture. She sold all of it because she was moving out of state. And so here I am, you know, with my, you know, on my way, she told me, she told me, I think, um, the day before it was something. And I was like, oh shit, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? These pay, I, I don't take insurance. This is cash pay, private pay. I'm like, oh my God, I can't take furniture. I have like so many hours to get there, which was like one. Um, and there I go <laughs> taking my lawn chairs and wow. I, I, I wish to this day I would have taken picture a picture of those three lawn chairs. I wish I would have taken a picture of those three lawn chairs in this big ass empty office that wasn't mine, but that's where it started. Like right yeah. then and there, that's where it started. And I, I love that. Right. I'm, I would, I would put, create a big, I don't know what the sizes are. I'm not good with whatever measurements, but I'll put yeah. a big ass picture right in my waiting room of those three damn lawn chairs. And I was so yes. embarrassed, right? I was so embarrassed that here I am, I'm charging these people this amount and, you know, um, I should be ashamed of myself. There's no way. This is an embarrassment. This is humiliation. I should be way farther than where I'm at right now. And it's like, damn, I couldn't see it then. I see this. I see mm -hmm. this now. I see, hell yeah, my Mexican ass is yeah. in that chair providing badass <laughs> therapy to my, you know, to my client. Tell me right, I celebrate right. that now. But I, I, I love that. I love that you were able to acknowledge it. I love that your best friend went ahead and sent you those flowers and sent you that beautiful card because you deserve it, mm -hmm. right? You deserve it. You worked your ass yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I earned it. Hell yeah, you earned it. You earned it. Yeah. 
a yes. thousand percent. I did. You know, and mm-hmm. it was you stepping outside of your comfort zone to create this beautiful yeah. masterpiece that is helping and is going to continue helping so many people. So many people. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You. My last question. What is the one lesson you want your readers to take away from your book? I think the biggest lesson for me is, and I say this in the book, but when presented with choices, always choose the possibility of happiness. Oh, shit, yes. You know, then that's that's where I was in my marriage. And and I'll I'll say this, you know, my ex-husband and I still loved each other. Mm-hmm. Um and 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 that love continued after our divorce and we raised our kids together, but we weren't happy. Yeah. And I was terrified of leaving the status quo. Yeah. And I didn't know what was in front of me, but I thought it I might be happy if I left. Mm. there was a possibility there and I chose that possibility and it was the best. It wasn't the best decision I ever made, but I'm really glad that I made it because I think it preserved the love that he and I have for each other. And we were able to really be like terrific co-parents for our kids and finish raising them together in in ways that other people didn't um, support. Honestly, we took trips together. We, yeah, he had a key to the house. Like Hell he came yeah. over every morning for breakfast and came every night for dinner. And, and that's just how we chose to do it. And it really worked well for our family. But had I not chosen the possibility of happiness, it might've been contentious. Mm-hmm. You know, it might've been like your side, my side. Yeah. And our kids would have been divided, yeah. you know? So that's, that's what I tell people. Um, if, if one is lucky enough to have choices. Yeah, absolutely. to choose the possibility of happiness. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much you. for coming on. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable in your memoir. Thank you for being vulnerable here with me. Um, I appreciate you. I respect the work you're doing. I'm, I admire it. Um, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So where can we find the book Stash? Where can we follow you? How can we connect with you? Yes. Um, So Stash My Life in Hiding, if you just Google that, it'll show several places where you can purchase it, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere you get books online, you can buy it. Um, I really do advocate for independent bookstores. If you have one near you, if you're lucky enough to have an independent bookstore near you, um, buy it from them. If they don't have it, they'll order it for you. And that gives them the business. And then also might give them the indication they should order more copies of it. So <laughs> that's great. But bookstores are dying in our country. And I yeah. that just terrifies me. So, um, And then to find me, I'm on Instagram with my full name, at Laura Cathcart Robbins. And then my website is is lauracathcartrobbins.com and everything's on there. All my events, the book, the podcast, everything. We will have all of that in our show notes. Laura, again, thank you so much. And I'm wishing you all the best. Thank you. Raise your hand if you are ready to level up your marriage for 2023. Do you find that you're spending your time together with your husband checked out and in front of the TV? I know you're ready for tangible strategies that actually get you results. Reignite the spark in your marriage. Have fun and grow together. Well, I hope you have your hand raised at this minute because I have something special for you. I'm introducing my brand new six question marriage predictor quiz that's gonna give you personalized results to catapult you into the next stage of your marriage journey. That means you'll receive the results to where your marriage can get the best help. If you've got just one minute, head to veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. 
Again, that's veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. And you could take my brand new quiz, Marriage Predictor. Get your results delivered right to your email address. Again, that's veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. What's up, ladies? Just want to let you guys know that your ratings and reviews for this podcast are greatly appreciated. If you love this podcast, please go to iTunes right now, write a review, rate the episode, and subscribe. Don't forget to share it with your friends. Oh, hey, it's Erin. And I'm Michaela, and we're the hosts of the Two Sober Girls podcast, and we are on a mission to spill the wild truth about sobriety. Forget the rosé all day cliche. Sobriety is flipping amazing. Absolutely. It's not just about quitting the drink. It's a gift you give yourself and your loved ones. So what are you waiting for? Break up with that old toxic relationship with alcohol and let us show you the possibilities. And here's the thing. Everything your precious heart desires becomes way easier without the influence of alcohol. We're not just two sober girls. We're also wellness coaches. We're here to show you how to optimize health, lifestyle, and beauty, feel sexy and alive as F. So stay tuned because we're rolling out new episodes every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts and trust us. They have your name written all over them. We can't wait to share the magic of sobriety and wellness with you. Subscribe to Two Sober Girls Podcast today and come follow us on Instagram for behind the scenes action and send us a DM. We can't wait to meet you.